All right, go ahead and take your Bibles and go to James tonight, chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 14. I want to speak on a very important subject tonight. You know, I, as I've been, uh, we've been studying on different things in the Bible about the family, talking about ways to, you know, have a good family, raise good kids, all the stuff, you know, trying, trying to raise a family in this day and age we live in. It's not an easy thing. Trying to just be a good Christian as an individual is not an easy thing. And one thing that we do have to admit when it comes to, uh, you know, making it in this world we live in, there's only so much that we can do of ourselves. There's only so much that knowledge is going to accomplish for us. We do need to admit that for us to make it, for us to be successful, we kind of we have to tap into some supernatural power, don't we? I mean, let's just admit it. You know, there there are plenty of people out there that you know. I, I said I've been around long enough. I've seen some good families. I mean, good good people, good homes, teaching their kids the right things. And you know, you can't make anybody do right, can you? You, you, can't make, you can't make people do right. You can't make people do what you want them to do. But yet at the same time, as a parent especially, don't you want to sometimes make them? <laughs> you know, but, but you can't. And you definitely want to influence. You want to play a part. And so a subject I want to talk about tonight is something known as we call intercessory prayer. Okay? We all know praying is important. But tonight I want to talk about intercessory prayer. And that's when we talk about, you know, praying on behalf of someone else. There's a lot. We all need prayer, don't we? But you know what? Everybody needs prayer. And a lot of people, they're definitely not praying for themselves, are they? They definitely are not helping themselves out in any way. And you know what? We, I don't, I'm not willing to just take the attitude of, well, nothing I can do about it. And just wash my hands of it and say, I've done what I can and just walk away from it. Okay? Especially when it comes to my kids. I'm not just going to be like, well, I did my job as a parent. You know, it's all on them now. No, I'm, gonna, I'm always going to be concerned with what they do. Even after they grow up and leave my house, obviously, you know, it's on them now. But the truth is, as Christians, we have the ability to make a difference through prayer. And we need to make sure we take advantage of that. And I, wanna, I want us to look at some things in the Bible about intercessory prayer and in James chapter 5 verse 14 it says is any sick among you let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins they shall be forgiven him you know I don't think we're taking advantage of this like we should today this having the elders of the church come and lay hands and anoint people with oil and pray over them. I think this is a very important thing. The Bible is pretty clear on how it's done, and yet people get spooked away from this kind of stuff, and I think we ought to be doing it more. But verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Okay, notice how it says Elias or Elijah. He was a man of like passions as we are. We like to use our infirmities in our flesh as an excuse not to be spiritual. But let me tell you something, Elijah... He, had this, he was made out of the same flesh that you and I are made out of. But look at what that man was able to do. Was it because he didn't struggle with sin? Was it because he wasn't tempted? No, he dealt with the same things that we deal with. But the man, he got the job done. Verse 19, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You see that? I mean, boy, we see here very clearly in these passages that through prayer, we have the ability to change things. We have the ability to, uh, I mean, to change the course of nature. 
Literally, I mean, to, to change the direction in someone's life, to change their eternal destination. I mean, amazing things can happen through prayer, but prayer is something we often neglect. Or we just don't worry about it until we need something. And many Christians, they're not bothered at all by the fact that their prayer life is pretty much non-existent or it's just completely weak. But the truth of us, all of us are going to come to a point in our life where we are going to want to change something or change somebody and we're going to need we're going to need to know how to pray at that point. You know, thankfully, I mean, as far as I know, we don't have anybody here in the room that maybe has uh, a close family member, maybe a young child that is about to die. I mean, I've thankfully, I've never experienced that before, but I've been there before. I've had fa other family members who have, I mean, they've been that close to losing a child through death, through different things. And all they had was prayer. And some of you, you may have been there before where you were about to lose someone and all you had was prayer. And I'm going to tell you right now, as much as I hate to think about it, if one of my kids was about to die, I'm going to want to know how to pray at that point. I'm going to want to know how to change things through prayer at that point. I mean, I met all of you in here, you've probably had a family member or a loved one who was taking a wrong path in life. And they were grown up. They were an adult. There was nothing that you could do at that point. You couldn't physically restrain them. But boy, you wanted to change the course of events in their life. You wanted to change what they were doing. And, you know, the truth is many people, we don't start trying to figure out how to do these things in prayer until we're in that situation, until we're at that point where we're desperate. And the truth is, I think right now is the time to be planning for this to be preparing for it because you know none of us want to plan on anything bad happening i don't want to you know i'm not planning on one of my days my kids getting involved in you know my boys getting involved with a gang and you know getting in trouble with the law but you know what that could happen that very well could happen you know i don't i, I i'm not planning on my kids getting some disease that could take their life or getting in an accident where they're just hanging on to their life. But let's just face it, we live in a world where that kind of thing happens every day, don't we? Yes. And when that day comes, I think we're going to want to know how to pray. We're going to want to know how to change things through prayer. And you know, when that day comes, when we need that prayer, we all want that strong prayer life then, but many times it's too late. And so what do, what do we need to do to have an effective prayer life? What is, it that, what is it that we can do right now when we're not desperate? What is it that we can do right now to prepare for those days when we do get desperate? Because I'm just going to tell you, if you live long enough, you're probably going to be desperate before you die. Your day is going to come. I hope it doesn't. I hope you live a life of smooth sailing and easy waters and never have any troubles. And all of a sudden, one day when you just weren't expecting it, the rapture comes and boom, you got out of here with no trouble. All right? I hope that happens. But... Let's be a little bit realistic. It's probably not going to happen that way. So some things we need to remember about prayer is what our prayers can change the course of natural events. Okay, We saw the story there. It, it mentions Elijah and how through prayer he got it to stop raining for three and a half years. And then through prayer he got it to start raining again. Raining again. And the Bible credits all of that to Elijah and his prayer. And so understand our prayers. Okay, because once again, you know, we know we don't have any power. But the one we are praying to does have power. We know God is all powerful. Everything consists by him. He can change things. We've got story after story in the Bible. We have we see Joshua. The Bible says Joshua caused the sun to stand still. Now we know he didn't have the power to do that, but his God did, and when he prayed, when he asked for it, it happened. You know, we saw Moses. You know, we talked about Moses parting the Red Sea. Now, we know Moses didn't part the Red Sea. It was God that parted the Red Sea. But, you know, it was through Moses. And prayer, I mean, amazing things done time after time in the Bible. And our prayers can affect the course of natural events. Here in James chapter 5, verse 14, it tells us, you know, is any sick among you? Okay? Now, let's just face it. You know, we don't, you know, the Bible does not give us tricks to teach us how to heal someone i mean there's things that we can read in the bible see some things they did 
you know, that you could uh, apply to medicine and stuff. But the truth is, you know, if you have a physical problem, if you are sick, if you come to me for it, only come to me if you want to be prayed for. Because I'm not a doctor. I can't help you. I don't know a lot about health things. I'm just, I'm not real educated in that area. You know, you might be able to go to somebody like Brother Eric and he could help you out a little bit. But, you know, if you're going to, if you got a medical problem, you know, don't come to me unless it's about prayer because that's all I'm good for in that area. I don't know a lot about that. I, I've, you know, as much as I study the Bible, I haven't learned any tricks. I've, you know, I've read the miracles of Jesus and, you know, those were just, from all I can tell, those were just miracles. I haven't picked up on anything he did so I can go out and make somebody think I healed them of their, you know, leprosy or, you know, got a person who was crippled and not be crippled anymore. I don't know how to do that. Okay? I haven't figured that out. All I can do is pray. And we see here that if someone is sick, call for the elders of the church. It mentions the prayer of the faith. It can save the sick. You can get somebody to go from being sick to not being sick. That, I mean, being sick, it's a natural thing. I mean, we live in a world that has germs where there are diseases and the Bible has told us to pray for them. That's what, he's, that's what he said to do. Anoint them with oil. Have the elders of the church come. And our prayers can change the course of natural events. Yes. I mean, I th I'm thankful. I've never had a doctor tell me, hey, you've got cancer. I've never gotten that news. I've never been told I had some kind of fatal illness. You know, nobody in my family right now, none of my kids have been told anything like that. But you know what? I don't think it would be a good idea for me to wait around to figure out how to pray for those things and influence those things through prayer until after I find out. You know how many people they find out they've got some kind of fatal illness and they're gone just a few months later? Sometimes it comes up quick. You might not have a few months I mean, boy, when a, a strong prayer life is so important, and most people, because God's just blessing them so much, they take it for granted, and we're not, we're not even working on it. We're not trying to exercise that. You know, we're, not, we're not preparing at all. And you, you know why I'm not out practicing shooting that much? You know why I'm not going and learning self-defense skills and getting, you know, ninja training and anything like that because I'm not expecting to be in combat anytime soon when you look at the world we're living in maybe I should be preparing for some of those things a little bit but I'm just not expecting it okay I'm not out there doing like Rocky you know just vigorously training you know preparing for this big fight I'm not expecting to get into a fight anytime soon but you know what I should be expecting to need prayer to need it really bad and I should be training for that. I should be preparing for that. I, sh I mean, we all of us sh should be doing that, looking to strengthen our prayer life, looking to see God answer prayers. We ought to want to see that all the time, but we're not worried about it until it gets personal with us. We see that prayer can affect the weather. It mentioned Elijah in verse 17 and 18. Prayer, it can affect the weather. We see that prayer, it can affect where someone will spend eternity. You know, you can save a soul from death, hide a multitude of sins. We, I mean, it is amazing what prayer can do. We can, we can affect someone's path of life. I believe, too, when it talks about hiding a multitude of sins, when you, you know, pray, you pray somebody practically into the kingdom of God, you know, you pray and the Holy Spirit convicts them and they get saved. Think about all the sin that they would have done had they not been saved. You go out there and you lead a drunk to the Lord. I mean, think about this. We all love to talk about how much we hate alcohol. And we hate the alcohol companies and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? If we really want to hurt the alcohol companies, I don't believe in going and blowing up out beer establishments and things like that. I don't believe in setting fire to those places. But you know what I think we ought to do? What I would love to do? Go win their customers to the Lord. Let's do that. Go win their customers to the Lord. If people are, let's get all their customers saved so they go out of business. Wouldn't that, I mean, that's the way to do it right there. Not breaking any laws. You won't go to, you won't go to prison or anything like that. And look at what's going to change. We can get them in church on Sunday nights instead of going to the bars. We drive by the one bar every Sunday night on the way home when we go to the post office and we see drunks out there all the time. You know, I'd love to see those people here in church on Sunday night instead of in the bar. 
Instead, instead of ha put, giving their money to a bartender, put their money in the offering. Give their money to missions to help see pe more people saved. And we can make a difference in that area through prayer. But many times we, we're just, we don't think about it. We don't take advantage of it. We see also in the Bible that it is our responsibility to change things with prayer. Okay? God wants us doing this. God wants us involved in this kind of things. We've been commanded to pray. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 10, 17, the Bible says pray without ceasing. God wants us always asking him for things. It ought to just be instinctive for us. When we hear about anything, we, we go to God in prayer. That ought to be the first thing you do. When you get sick, the first thing you ought to do isn't call the doctor. The first thing you ought to do is call on the Lord. Many times he's the last one. I'm not telling you you can't go to the doctor, but, you know, pray. It ought to just be instinctive. Just, just pray. When you hear about a need, you know, pray. Just all the time, we ought to be praying all the time. We've been commanded to do that, and it's, it's our job to do that. You know, your doctor, most of your doctors aren't going to do that. You know, there are Christian doctors out there that understand the impact that prayer has. There are plenty of doctors out there who have been saved because they have seen miracles they have seen what prayer has done i mean i've heard a lot of testimonies from people you know that are in the in the medical field they've seen what prayer does they've seen people come out of things that they should not have come out of and they realize man there is a higher power out there they understand the science and all that kind of thing and but and they've seen when science has been defied and it's caused them to become a believer but understand though a lot of them don't pray. And you know what? It's not their job. That's our job to be influencing things through prayer. It's our job you know, to be praying for people. And unfortunately, even Christians sometimes, we're so self-centered, we're not praying for others. We're not praying for people in our church. We're not even praying for our own families. People wonder why maybe their churches are having problems and churches are going downhill. They're not praying for each other. They're not praying for the pastor. They're not trying to influence things through prayer. Many times with people, prayer is nothing more than a gripe session, a complaint session. You know, Lord, I'm just coming to pray right now. And Lord, I need you to fix this. I need you to fix that. This is a mess. You know, this is bad. This, they're not trying to change anything. They don't look at, they don't, whenever they go to God in prayer, they are not looking at the situation they're praying for like it's their responsibility. And I think that's how we ought to feel. When you pray, you ought to pray with the attitude that, hey, I need to get this prayer answered because I might be the only one praying. I might be the only person, that, I might be the only way that person has a chance of getting saved. My prayer. I mean, your neighbor that you have, that none of us know, that only you know, who do you think's praying for them right now? Your other neighbors probably aren't. Us in the church, we're probably not praying for them if we don't know them unless you get them on the prayer list. But, you know, most people don't even have enough prayer, faith to put something on a prayer list. Listen, if we really thought that prayer worked, you know, we're going to get things on a prayer list. But, you know, a lot of times we have this attitude, well, I'm going to put it on the prayer list, but nobody's going to pray. But, what, you know, this ought, to be the, this ought to be the kind of place. I want to be the kind of church where, I mean, people are begging to get stuff on our prayer list because we're always seeing our prayers answered. And if we were the kind of prayer warriors we should be, that's exactly what would happen. Because I, I know the people out there that are good prayer warriors, and I love having those people pray for me. I like to let them know if something's going on, if I have a need, because I want those people praying for me. I'm thankful. I had a guy just this week. Uh, you know, I vaguely knew him. I knew who he was. He was from the church there in Bourbon A. And I was talking to him, and he mentions that he prays for me every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm on his prayer list. And I appreciated that. I, I was thankful to hear that they pray for me. That church there in Bourbon A, they, I mean, there, there, are, there are many people in that church. You know, they, they helped us out when we got this church started. And I know the people they are praying for us. I, whenever I see people from there, they're always asking. They mention that they're praying. And one of the reasons I know that they pray is because a lot of times we pray, we say we pray, but we're never willing to do anything else. Where that church, they've actually, there's been something behind their prayer. You know, they, they had many people who came out and help knock doors and stuff uh, when we before we started the church here. You know, they gave financially. In fact, when we showed up there this week, the pastor came, 
handed me a check, a love offering from the church. I wasn't expecting that. But you know, this church cares. And they're praying, and they don't want to just pray. You know, they want to do something about it. They want to make a difference. And man, I love that. I want that to be us. I want us to be the kind of church that's doing that, where we care about what goes on in other places. And we're the ones, we're praying for other people. We're not just praying, but we are backing it up with our actions. We see in the Bible that if you say you have faith, but there's no works with it, the Bible says your faith is dead. And I want us to be the kind of church, we're not just praying for people, but we're backing it up with our works. We're doing things for them. You can say you're praying for someone who's sick, but you don't even visit them in the hospital. You know, I wonder about that. You know, you say that you're praying for someone because they have a need, but you're not willing to help out in any way. You're gonna, I wonder about that a little bit. And it is our responsibility to do something in this area. Your coworkers probably aren't going to pray for you. You know, your lost family members probably aren't going to pray for you. It's saved people. It's our job to do the praying. And we ought to have the attitude when you're praying for anything that this all depends on me getting my prayers answered. And when you, when you have that attitude, when you realize, hey, this is my responsibility to get something done through prayer, it's going to cause you, it's going to, cause you to change some things about yourself. Okay, because notice what it says in James chapter 5, verse 16. And I think this is what we're missing when it comes to our prayer, okay? Because so I think we all pray, but we all don't always see results from our prayer. But notice what it says in verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, okay? If your prayers aren't getting answered, it's not because of God. It's not because he's low on power. It's because of you. Yeah. Notice who gets their prayers answered. Okay, it's, it, it mentions the prayer of the faith Okay, will save the sick. Many times our prayers don't get answered because our faith is weak. Now, what excuse do we have for weak faith? None. We have no excuse for weak faith. With all that we have seen just in God's Word, we have, we have God's Word today. If you have a Bible... You have no excuse for weak faith. If you are saved, and you know you're saved, you have no excuse for weak faith. If you, you, you know, it's, we believe that God can save our sin, our souls, and take us to heaven. That He can cleanse our sin, but we don't believe He can heal someone of cancer. We don't believe that He could change the course of someone's life. We don't believe He can turn a backslider back towards Him. We, don't, we believe that he saved us, but we don't believe he can save our neighbor. We have no excuse for lack of faith. But let's just admit it, we struggle in that area sometimes. And you know what? That's where the exercising comes in. That's where, you know, making the effort to strengthen your faith, okay? We, we should be strong in faith. Imagine, you know, what it's like to be living in some of these countries out there today where people are being killed for their faith. Okay? We're seeing it more and more around the world where Christians are being persecuted for their faith. Okay? That's, that's going to take some strength. Imagine being in prison. Okay? Now you and I, we're not, trying, we're not training for that, are we? We're not preparing ourselves for that right now because we don't think we need to. We don't think we need that kind of faith. But listen... When that day comes where you have a family member, where you have a child that needs prayer, and all they have is prayer, you are going to wish you were a strong prayer at that point. You're going to wish your faith was strong at that point. Don't wait. Do something about it now. Our faith is weak. Also, another reason our prayers don't get answered sometimes is our flesh is weak. We see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, where Jesus he told his disciples to watch and pray. He, just, he was going to go pray, and he wanted them just, just for an hour. I need you to watch and pray. And they kept falling asleep. And he told them, he said, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay? And that's, I mean, that's it right there. I mean, if I asked all of you, hey, who wants to be a strong prayer warrior? I think we'd all raise our hands, but yet we're not strong prayer warriors. Why? Because our flesh is weak. We start praying and we get bored. Why? That's your flesh. 
getting bored. We start praying and we start having doubts. That's your flesh. We start praying and we get distracted by everything. We get, some, we get distracted by our cell phone going off and getting notifications or the television or the radio that's playing. We've always got, we're always surrounded by so many things that distract us. We can't even focus. We can't even pay attention. That's not God's fault. That's your flesh's fault. That's why the Bible talks about praying in your closet. Okay? It's telling us so you just need to get alone sometime. Find a place. You know, go find, if, if you have to, go find, go to some park somewhere, state park, and find a place in the wilderness where it's only going to be you and nature. And pray there. If that's what you have to do to get a hold of God, if that's what you have to do to remove distractions, then do that. Because you, we need to get a hold of God. We need to, and our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. So you know what? How about we strengthen our spirit? And how about we crucify our flesh? How about we die to our flesh? Like the Bible tells us to do, like the Apostle Paul, who said, I die daily. Okay? And our flesh, we pay way too much attention to our flesh, and we neglect the spirit. And one of these days, you are, you are going to be in that position where you wish more than anything that you were somebody who could change things through prayer. You were somebody who had strong faith and had a weak flesh. But there is no excuse for weak faith. When something's weak, it's because it hasn't been exercised. Think about it. That, that's the only reason our faith is weak. It hasn't been exercised. Okay? Our muscles that we have physically that are weak, it's because they're not exercised. We do not use those muscles enough and our faith is weak because we're not using faith. We don't use faith when it comes to anything. We're not praying on a regular basis. Whenever things are bad, we don't, we don't go to prayer. We go to everything else that the world has to offer. You know, whenever we're trying to get stronger spiritually, you know, we don't go to the Word of God. We go to self-help books that are out there, you know, written by lost people. And we go to psychology and all these things. I'm telling you right now, if your faith is weak, it's just because it hasn't been exercised. And, that, and here's the thing, too. As we see how wicked this world's getting, what excuse do we have for our faith not being exercised? I mean, you would think it would be being exercised today, but we will do anything to avoid strenuous activity physically sometimes and definitely strenuous activity spiritually. Many people, when they go to church, they'll go and they'll hear the preaching and they get convicted. And you know what they do? Instead of getting right, they run and never go back to that church again. And then they talk about how bad the preacher is because he made them feel bad. Oh, it wasn't the preacher that made you feel bad. It was the Holy Spirit that made you feel bad. Put some pressure on you. And instead we run from it. Do anything to avoid it. And we have no excuse. Our, many times it's our fight that's weak. Okay. Notice how it said in James chapter 5, in verse uh, 16, you know, the effectual, okay, the effectual fervent prayer. One that, an effectual one, one that makes a difference, one that, one that has an impact, one that actually changes things, and it mentions that fervent, the effectual fervent prayer. That word fervent, it means, really it means, means hot, to boil. Okay, we're talking about something that's intense something that is i mean it's real and the truth is our prayers aren't real fervent sometimes oh lord heal this person lord answer you know answer this request lord will you please save my neighbor we we we, we don't mean it we don't mean it at all but you know when people do pray fervent prayers it's when they have that family member dying when that person maybe has that accident and they know what's going to happen now all of a sudden their prayers get fervent at that point. But fervency by itself isn't enough. You've got to have some faith, don't you? You've got to have that faith. And if you haven't exercised that faith, then just being fervent isn't going to cut it. That definitely is a huge part of it and that helps. But you've got to do the other things too. You've got to really want what you're asking for. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8 says, And above all things... Have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And what that's talking about there, when you have 
fervent charity or when you, I mean, you have a strong love for someone, that love, it's going to cover that person's sins. You're going to overlook those things. You're not, you know, what, many times, you know, you know why we see that we have no problem passing up people if they're holding the sign saying, you know, we'll work for food, need money. You know why we don't have a problem passing those people up? We don't love them. Let's just admit it. There, there's no strong love there for that. And so what do we do? We make, you know, we make excuses for ourselves. Well, they probably lost their, you know, they're probably too lazy to go get a real job. They probably do drugs. You know, we'll start saying all these things about them that might be true. But when you love someone, okay, when you have fervent charity, okay, for example, if it was your child, okay, if, if your child is hungry, maybe your child's a drug addict, maybe your child's a criminal, maybe your child is lazy, but you know what? You want to do something for them, don't you? You want to help them. You know why? Because you have fervent charity. You have a fervent love for them, and it hides a multitude of sins. You don't care because that's your child. You love that person, and when you love someone, okay, when you have a fervent love, it's you're going to overlook certain things. And one of the reasons people, they get so irritated with others in church, they don't have a fervent love for other people in the church, and so they let everything bother them. But when you really love someone, you're going to overlook things. You're going to, you're going to and that, that love will hide a multitude of sin, that fervent charity. And we don't have fervent prayers many times because we don't really care. It's not a big deal. But notice that is the prayers that availeth much, that accomplishes something that is productive, the effectual fervent prayer. But then there's another word we haven't used yet in there. What kind of person righteous man of a righteous man that word righteous it simply means just okay now we know if you're saved you are righteous in the eyes of god when it comes to where you're going to spend eternity god sees us as righteous because the blood of christ cleanses us from sins and when we stand before god we will stand before him righteous because of jesus christ however you can be saved and considered righteous in that area, but earthly speaking, we can be unjust. We can be unrighteous. Okay? You know, I, I am righteous when it comes to the commandment in the Bible of thou shalt not kill. I've never murdered anybody before. I'm righteous in that area, but there's other areas where I'm not righteous. There's other, there's other commands uh, that I have broken, things that I have not followed Areas I'm not righteous, I'm not going to tell you about them right now. But you know, we, we all have those things, don't we? And notice the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. One who is a just person. What, uh, those are the ones that are going to get their prayers answered. And let me tell you something right now. You can't just all of a sudden, one day when your kid's in a hospital die and just decide, I want to be righteous now. You've been living for the devil you know, you've been backslidden on God for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, now that you have a desperate need, you're just going to go declare yourself righteous and expect God to answer your fervent prayer? See, that's why right now, we need to be making sure we're righteous. Most people, they are, they're not thinking about that. If you, I mean, think about it. If it meant seeing your child survive something, if, if I mean, think about think about one of your children. If they were in a hospital dying right now, and I came to you and said, "Listen, your child can be healed, but you have to swear never to watch television for the rest of your life, never to you know, never to say another cuss word, never." And I just give you all these you know rules that you ought to. Man, you'd gladly do that. You would go and you'd throw your TV out if it would save your kid's life. I mean, you'd give away all your money. You'd, you'd do whatever you had to do to save their life at that point, wouldn't you? Okay? And then I know, and I'm, but when it comes to sin, you know, if, the, if, it, if it came down to that and God said you have to do this to fix their problem, we would do that, wouldn't we? But why don't we get rid of sin now? Why would we wait for 
you know, God to try to take one of our children before we're willing to give up sins that he's convicted us about. Hey, if the Lord's convicted you of something, if he showed you that something you're doing is wrong, why don't you get rid of it now? Don't wait until you need a prayer answered. God sees right through that. Do something about it now. Work on your righteousness right now. Don't wait until you need to be righteous or you think you need to be righteous. Do something about it right now. And those are the people that get their prayers answered. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. We see that it's said in that passage to confess your faults one to another. We, it's very clear in the Bible that for our, our prayers can be hindered when we're not right with other people. If you're not right with your spouse, your prayers are going to be hindered. We see that in the Bible. If you're not right with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you will not, your prayers are going to be hindered. You're not going to get your prayers answered. And we see throughout the Bible how important it is to make sure we are right with each other. Why? So our prayers won't be hindered. And there are many people out there today, they are, I mean, they're having one conflict after another with God's people, with their family, and then all of a sudden now they need a prayer answered desperately. Hey, it sometimes takes a while to fix those things. It takes a while to mend things. It takes a while to get things right. If I've got a child in the hospital and they're maybe only hours or days away from dying, I need my prayer answered that day. I might not have time to go around and find all the people that I need to get right with. I might not have time to go around and be making up. That's why I should do that now. If you've got problems right now, if you have conflicts right now, you need to deal with those things because you don't know when you are going to need to be that righteous man. You don't know. I mean, and obviously I think we always need to be, but our flesh tells us we don't need it. Uh, you're, you know, our flesh, right, even right now, while I'm preaching this, you might be thinking, yeah, I don't, I don't need this right now. But if, if that's the case, thank God for that. Thank God that, you know, you're not desperate right now, but the day is going to come, that the Lord tarries is coming, where you are going to need to be that person who knows how to change the course of events, to change the direction of someone's life, to change where someone is going to spend eternity through prayer. And so right now we should start working on these things. Right now you should start strengthening your faith. Right now you should be trying to be more righteous, trying to exercise your prayer life, see things answered, watch your faith be increased. That can make all the difference in the world. See, intercessory prayer, it's, it's not all about you. Okay, Interceding, we see throughout the Bible where God makes, inter, or Jesus Christ makes intercession for us, doesn't he? He's the one that kind of gets between God and us. He makes intercession for us. He is our advocate, the Bible, Bible calls him. He, he goes between us and God, and he keeps us out of trouble. He keeps us out of a lot of trouble. And that's what we're supposed to do for other people. We're we should be an intercessor for our neighbor. We should be going to God in prayer for our neighbor, for your lost neighbor, for your lost co-workers. We ought to be the intercessor for them. I mean, who, who else is going to win your co-workers to the Lord? Who else is going to win your neighbors to the Lord? If, you're, if they're going through a hard time, who else is going to pray for them? There is no one else to do that. It needs to be you. You need to be an intercessor for them. Jesus Christ does that for us every day. We've got the devil accusing us all the time to God, always accusing us, and he doesn't even have to lie, does he? he, did, when, he when it comes to accusing the brethren, that's one time when Satan doesn't even need to lie. But thank God Jesus is there making intercession for us. And there are people around. We ought to, you know, the, the, our co-workers... Neighbors, those are the people we ought to practice on. Okay, if you, because said, you know, my, like I said, my children, right now, I'm not, I don't, I haven't, have, I'm not having any trouble with them joining gangs and dealing drugs or anything like that. So you, know, but, what if that day comes? Well, I'm going to want to know how to pray them out of that. So you know what? There are people I do know involved in that kind of thing. Why don't I start working on them? Why don't I start making intercession for them? praying for them and then I can I'll learn my faith will be increased I'll, I'll know how to do it and if that day ever comes I'll know how to change things and or you know the day may come where I need you all interceding for me 
Well, it's probably going to help if I've been if I've been an intercessor for others, you know, and God, you know, I've gotten God to be merciful to other people through my prayers. You, God might do the same thing with other people, but I've got I've got to be interceding for others. See, but many times we only pray for those that it benefits us to pray for. It definitely benefits me to pray for my children, doesn't it? It benefits me to pray for all of you. Okay, because you all are, you know, go to my church. But we ought to be praying for those. We ought to be interceding for those whose blessings will not benefit us in any way. I mean, it is, a, to me, the way I see it, a prayer for my kids is kind of a selfish prayer. Even a prayer for all of you, it's kind of a selfish prayer. I mean, you know, if I'm praying for the Lord to just bless all of you financially and make you all rich, well, that could, that could come back around and help me out, you know, because you all are going to be given more, right? <laughs> but if I'm doing that for my neighbor, it's not going to benefit me one bit. That's when, you know, the Lord knows it's a real thing. And I, sh I should be doing that. You should be doing that, interceding for other people. And then if you and practice on them, and then that when, if that day comes where it's your child, your close family member, you're going to know what to do. You will be prepared. And, you know, I, I've never taken a CPR class. I probably should. Because what well, if the day comes where I need it? I'm going to want to know how to do it. I mean, I, I've seen it done on TV enough times. I think I know what to do. I, I, I'd make an attempt if I had to, but I might do it wrong and help them die. <laughs> you know, but the, the, the truth is, you know, a lot of times we do, we're, we're just, we, don't, we don't plan for that. We should plan on needing to pray people out of trouble, pray people you know away from hell, because we're definitely going to need it. There's going to be a time when it becomes personal, and so I hope you'll do that. Work on your prayer life. Start interceding for other people. Start doing it now. Strengthen your faith now. Work on your righteousness right now, and then when that day comes, you'll know what to do. You, you'll be at peace. I've seen those people in dark times where if I'm like, if that was me, I don't know what I'd do. These people are just fine. They're calm. God answers their prayer. And it's like, how did they do? Hey, because they were old pros. That wasn't their first time. They changed things through prayer. And so I hope you'll do that. So let's all stand together right now.